everyone. Thank you for having me here. And now I'd like to start with a little bit of an exercise. Everyone close your eyes real quick and think about that first moon landing, Apollo 11. What is it that you guys see in your mind? I'm guessing there might be a few of you out there that see a lunar lander coming down, kicking up some dust. But for the majority of you, it is probably a spacesuit. You see someone on the surface saluting a flag, the cragginess of the moon reflected in their helmet. And that's because the spacesuit is so iconic. It becomes really its own character in the story of exploration. So it might be natural to assume, when you're designing a spacesuit, that the first thing you think about is, all right, how can I look awesome? <laughs> And so in Hollywood, that leads to a lot of different solutions out there, right? <laughs> One of the big important things if you're designing a spacesuit is that you can see all those facial features, that you get the lighting just right, and everything like that. Make it look cool, make it look sexy, perhaps slim fitting. You know, you want to look good while you're out there. However, in real life, things are a little more complicated. As a spacesuit engineer, we really start every design problem with the two same basic questions. Where are you going, and what are you doing? And from these two questions, you can start to understand what are the confines of your problem, right? The where defines all of your external constraints, what sort of things are you working with, what sort of gravity field, what sort of terrain, what's the temperature range you have to operate in, what sort of pressure environment is there, and is there a radiation problem? The what defines the type of task that you're going to be asked to do when you're on the surface trying to do your job. So just as a brief example of how this works, say that I'm asking you to go to a beach. Your job is to build a sandcastle. Think about what you might be wearing, what sort of tools you need to bring with you to do this job. You're probably going to take a swimsuit, something lightweight, a little bit of sunblock, you don't want to get sunburned, um, sunglasses, bucket, shovel, and that'll get the job done, right? Now, if we change those parameters just a little bit, Still building a castle out of the natural environment, but now things are a little bit different. Instead of sand, it's snow. Instead of being nice and sunny, it's going to be super cold. So how you think about this, what tools you bring, and what you wear is going to be a little bit different. Instead of that swimsuit, probably a warm coat. Instead of lightweight top, some snow pants. And the list goes on. So you really have to think about the design problem, where you're going, and what you're doing. So today, on the International Space Station, where we're going is low Earth orbit, which is about 200 miles above the surface of Earth. There isn't an atmosphere, so it's vacuum. There isn't really any radiation shielding up there. It's got an active micrometeorite field. You have a day-night cycle every 90 minutes, and really the gravity is mostly negligible. What are we asking you to do out there? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So when you get out there, the space station is really your basic 20-year-old house. It's been there. You're going to have to do some repairs. So you're going to do a little electrical work, a little plumbing work. You're going to do all of this outside, though. So you really have to think about those tasks from a work perspective. But let's start with that environment. What does that mean to us? So if you're in a vacuum atmosphere, it's really going to suck for humans. <laughs> Without a, uh, in a vacuum, that means basically there's no air, there's no oxygen for you to breathe. And so that's really a problem because humans can only last about 15 to 30 seconds, depending on how much oxygen you have in your lungs already, uh, before you start to experience cognizant deficit, and if that continues, eventually death. This has only happened once uh, that we know of, and this is our test subject back in the 70s, testing out one of our spacesuits, and he did experience vacuum. And you can see that he passed out on the treadmill. The last thing that he remembered before passing out was having the spit start to boil on the back of his tongue. Luckily, we were able to repressurize the chamber, and he was just fine afterwards, because we responded quickly. But again, these are some of the problems you have to think about. So as we build our space, and we provide that oxygen environment around you so you can continue to do your job normally. The next problem that you have in space in a vacuum, that gas expands as pressure decreases. And so, as you can see with this video here, this is a balloon. It's filled with a certain amount of oxygen. But as the pressure around it decreases, the gas expands. And this is what's happening inside your body as well. So here on Earth, we have about 14.7 PSI around us all the time. And that keeps everything inside of our body functioning normally. If we take that pressure away, then no longer have the balance within our body, and all the gas that's trapped inside there starts to expand. Now, it's not like the movies. You're not going to see instant cellular explosion on a large scale, and your body falls apart. It's not that exciting. But what does happen is you start to have, inside of your lungs, the tiny little alveolar that are exchanging gas begin to explode. And that makes it really hard for you to breathe. 
So what we do is we provide, again, the pressure around your body to keep it constant so your body functions normally within the spacesuit. The other big problem with the vacuum is that the boiling point of water decreases with pressure. Thinking back to our friend, the test subject, who uh, passed out because he was exposed to vacuum, you can see here in this video, the water, the boiling point of water goes down. When you are at about vacuum, the boiling point of water is around 97 degrees Fahrenheit, which coincidentally is right around human body temperature. So this is where the point, all the water that's in your body, in your blood, starts to be a problem for you, the human. So again, we have to make sure that our spacesuit provides all that necessary atmosphere around the body. So with our spacesuit, it's kind of like a big balloon. So what it does for you is inside that layer, you can either provide pressure via mechanical counterpressure, which is kind of like putting on a very tight pair of Spanx or think of a really wet wetsuit, and it's compressing your skin directly through mechanical pressure. If you don't want to do it that way, you can have a more traditional approach, which we use on the space station, which is a gas-filled balloon. And this, again, keeps your body pressure so everything is in balance. Now that we've taken care of the vacuum situation, we got to worry about the extreme temperatures. On the space station, it goes from about minus 50 degrees to about positive 150 degrees. That's a really big temperature swing, and you're directly exposed to that when you're outside working on the space station. When you're in space, there are a couple of different ways that you can transfer heat. Here on Earth, there are three mechanisms. One of those uh, is conduction, so that means directly touching something, things trying to equalize the temperature between them. Uh, it can be through convection. That doesn't matter in space because, again, it's a vacuum, so there's no molecules in the air for which you have convection. But instead, you also have radiation. That means the heat is getting reflected off of one object and absorbed by the other. And so when you do that, we need to really think about how do we design our spacesuit to really keep the external environment out and really isolate you from all of that. So what we have is we really make you an insulator by doing a number of different layers in the spacesuit. Our layered approach keeps, again, um, the temperature of the astronaut, when we are talking about radiation, we have it, the white of the spacesuit reflects radiation back out, so there's no radiative heating. And then we talk about conduction. So again, that's heat transfer by touching two things, trying to be the same. So we have multiple layers of uh, insulation that are separated by vacuum, so they never touch. And therefore, we don't have conduction there. But this makes another problem. Now that you've isolated yourself from the environment, you're doing work inside of that spacesuit. You're building up a lot of heat because you're building up all your muscle heat. And when you do that, it's kind of like working in a thermos. So we have to figure out how are we going to remove that heat from the inside of the spacesuit. What we do is we actually have what we call a liquid cooling garment. And so this is a very conformal, always flattering white spandex. And through that, we have about 200 feet of tubing. And that tubing has cold water that runs directly against your skin. And through conduction, it's picking up all the heat from your body and rejecting it back out through basically a heat exchanger in the back of your spacesuit. So continuously, you can adjust how much flow is going through that cooling garment. And the more flow you have, the more heat you can pull up from your skin. The last of our problems once we're at the ISS is radiation. It is very pretty, but it is also pretty dangerous to the humans. When you're out there, you don't have any inherent radiation shielding. Here on Earth, we do have an atmosphere, and that helps take care of some of the high energy particles. So when you're in space without all that atmosphere, we have to do something different. The primary way that you're going to have a radiation issue is through your eyes. And so the helmet of our spacesuit actually has a sun shield on it that is very reflective and is better than any pair of sunglasses you're going to find here on Earth. But it does a great job of protecting your eyes. And we also have different parts of your spacesuit that are going to absorb some of that extra energy. On top of that, one of the best things we can do is actually monitor how much radiation is coming to the astronaut throughout all of their missions and making sure we keep that underneath a safe dose. The last problem that we're going to talk about is micrometeorites. These things seem like they would be a very small problem because we're talking things the size of a paint chip, but they can cause a big impact because they are moving at 17,500 miles per hour. And so in this video, uh, you can see that a small steel ball gets shot through a half-inch steel plate. And so that's moving at that speed. That is a lot of damage. It blows right through the plate, even though it's super small, as you can see in the picture there. It leaves a big hole. And so you think about that. How do you protect astronauts from that? Your spacesuit can't be an armored tank. It'd be too heavy and you can't move. So what do we do about that? And it comes down to kinetic energy. So you're looking at something, it's <laughs> kinetic energy equals one half the mass of something times its velocity squared. So our approach 
is to take um, that little thing that's coming through there and make it smaller and smaller, because every time it goes through a layer, it's going to get smaller, it's going to get slower. So ideally, by the time it gets to the innermost layer of your spacesuit, it's going to be sufficiently small and sufficiently slow that it's never going to break into that pressure bubble. OK, great. Now you're safe. You're done everything you need to do to uh, be protected inside your spacesuit. Now that you say, what do you really need me to do in here? So working outside ISS, like I said, it's one of those places that's your 20-year-old house. You're doing plumbing. You're doing electrical work. You're moving large objects in and out of the garage. And as all you do this, it's in microgravity, which means that you're not using your feet to do much of anything because you're not walking. All your walking is going to be done with your hands. And so you really focus on moving your body in a different way and designing your spacesuit to work with the way that your body is going to move in microgravity. So for us, that really starts focusing on everything is a giant kinematic chain. You move your fingers here, it's going to connect all the way up through your shoulders. And so we start by thinking about how do we need to angle those shoulder bearings to give you that full range of motion. Then we add another bearing, so you get this sort of motion with your arms, and you keep going down the chain until you can work in this entire work envelope that's really optimized for where we want to have our tools. When we think about sizing, you got to really think about those gloves. Again, you're doing all of your work with your hands. And so when we think about that, we have <laughs> over 50 measurements we take on your hands alone to size those gloves for you. And within each size of gloves, we can actually adjust each of the fingers by about a quarter of an inch. So there's a lot of adjustability as you go through and you can do your job well. When it comes to the lower body of your spacesuit, it doesn't really have to do so much when you're talking about microgravity. What you really want is a stable platform from which to work, because it is microgravity. Anytime you push off of something, it's going to push you back the other direction. And so if we can lock your lower body and make it stable, you can have a lot more freedom to do the work you need to do around in your upper body. And lastly, we do have a life support system. It is that big backpack on the back of your spacesuit. If you think about a spacesuit, it really is its own spacecraft. Everything that the International Space Station has to provide to keep the human alive, a spacesuit has to do that in a smaller human-shaped package. And so thinking about all of those products, these are all in your life support system. And you also have to control them once you're inside of the spacesuit. Now, there's not a lot of real estate left on your spacesuit once you add in all of the mobility that you need to do your job. And so we had to place those controls on the front of the suit. Now, if you look at the front of the suit, you might notice it looks a bit odd, right? All the writing looks like it's inverse. And that's because it's sitting right here on your chest. If you were to put your hand at the top of your chest, look down and try to see your belly button. It's impossible. Can't see it. And so instead, we actually have to wear a mirror on the wrist. And so the mirror is how they can see all the settings of their controls. And this is why it's backward here. So it looks correct in the wrist mirror as they're doing their jobs. Um, the life support system, it provides the communication system. So this is where you have your speakers and your microphone volume control. It has the pressurization. So depending on what part of your mission, you might be from no pressure because you're inside the vehicle, all the way up to EVA pressure once you're outside. All of that's controlled right here on your spacesuit. Then once you're outside, we need to talk about some of those tools. Um, because you're doing maintenance tasks, you can't just do that everything with your hands. We provide some of the tools to work with it. And because it is microgravity, you have to think about how those tools connect to the person. You're going to need a foot restraint. And this is the part of the spacesuit that's going to keep you in one place again, making it a stable platform. And so our boots and the foot restraint are actually designed together. There is a clip on the back of the boot. You slide in, and it locks you into place. So your boots aren't going anywhere. You can have a stable platform to do your job. We also have tethers, but those tethers need to go someplace. And so you clip one end onto your spacesuit, and that way, if you drop your hammer, it's not going to float off and come back and hit you later. Um, we also have a specific mini workstation, or a tool belt, if you will. And this is where you can plug in your heavier tools and your trash bag. And so it keeps everything, again, within that work envelope right in front of your body. It makes it easy to access, easy to find. You can take it all with you at one time when you go out the door. Um, the last thing that we have in there is we have a place to actually mount the spacesuit into the airlock because this is a really heavy garment. If you think about it, it's like putting on a hard tank top and a 40-pound pair of pants. And so when you do that, it's nice to have it supported against the wall as you're putting it on and off. When we talk about our next big leap, though, going back to the moon, the requirements change a little bit. Where you're going and what you're doing starts to look a little bit different. 
This time, we're going to the lunar surface, which that means still no atmosphere. Great, we know how to do that. But now we do have some gravity, and that really starts to affect the design of your system. We still need radiation shielding, but now we also have dirt. Dirt becomes a real problem on the moon, and so we have to think of ways to handle that. But when we talk about our tasks, those are also something that's changing. Instead of just walking with our hands, now we've got to start using our legs and feet again. So thinking about how do we design for mobility there as well. We also have to think about our tasks. It's not just assembling, but now we're going to do science. We're going to do field geology. We're going to start mining the minerals that we find there. So that changes how we design our spacesuit. The dust is a problem that we learned in the Apollo program. It is very sharp, it is very abrasive, it gets into everything. And so we have to really think creative ways about how to make sure that our hardware lasts longer and that people stay safe. Some of the approaches that we talked about, we can look at a phased approach that really starts the spacesuit garment. We can either make it where we can absorb all that dust or we can actively repel it, looking at new materials and new coatings. Also, you can have parts of your whole habitat system where you basically have a mudroom where you can shower all that dust off of you to keep it clean and don't bring it inside. Or one of the more popular solutions is to never bring that dirty suit inside at all. This is a concept we call the suit port. And in this idea, you actually use a rear door of the spacesuit itself to come in and out, but the suit is mounted on the outside of your vehicle. And this is a concept, again, it keeps all that dirt and muck outside, but then we still have to worry about the challenges of resizing and maintenance of your spacesuit. So with everything that becomes helpful, there's also a consequence, and it's all about balancing those two. When it comes to thermal, again, you have to think about this new environment. No longer is it just minus 50F all the way to 150. Now it's as cold as almost absolute zero to going up to positive 250. It's a wide spectrum if you want to go anywhere on the surface. And so really, that changes how we want to do those thermal tasks. When we talk about exploration, we talk again about doing geology. This means kneeling down, picking up rocks, putting in samples, doing this all in a clean manner, practicing for Mars. So it's very different than what we've been doing on the outside of space station. And also, when you go to the surface, you get a set of wheels. You want to go further. But how you design that moon buggy really affects how you design your spacesuit. You want the two to work together. When we look at mobility, Everyone probably remembers those videos from Apollo. You can see they're a little bit awkward. They bounce around. Trust me, they bounce around. Do a bunny hop. <laughs> they do a lot of falling. It's not very graceful. And that's from the spacesuit itself. It wasn't designed with all the mobility. It was designed to be lightweight. Um, but today, when we think about going back for sustainable missions, we want something that is smooth and it's easy to walk in. This is one of our prototypes where you can see it has bearings throughout, which makes it a very natural walking motion, as opposed to Apollo, which had no bearings. You kind of Frankenstein walked. And this makes it a lot easier to have a more natural mobility. But that comes at the cost of mass. It comes with bearings that are going to get dusty and clogged. So you really, again, are trading off all these different aspects. So as we go through, part of our job as designers, we build a prototype. We test the heck out of it in all sorts of different analog environments, whether it's in the deserts of Arizona, on the zero gravity plane, or in the MBL. We learn everything we can about them, and then we, fin we find out what works from our astronaut customers and incorporate those design tweaks prototype again. And as we continue to learn more, we're getting better and faster with how we do that. We're going through, we're using CAD models to pre-fit our prototypes, building something cheap with a 3D printer just to test out the basic fit and concept before eventually moving on to a full pressurizable prototype. And again, this is the same process as everybody else, build, test, repeat. It's all about how quickly and efficiently we can do our design. And so as we go forward, that's how it's going to be. We find our mission, define our requirements, and move forward, build, test, repeat until we get to Mars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Oh, thank you. Now, uh, to me, it seems like that's a pretty strict frame in which to try and design. Do you find like a, very, a little bit more limitations than there would be on Earth? Do you find there are any benefits to that, or? Compared to Apollo, it is kind of a small box. The Apollo missions, we had to do all the spectrum, everything from launch to landing in a single spacesuit. So that really compromised how you could do your requirements. But now when we're going back, we have multiple spacesuits, so we can really focus our design on the one task that's on the lunar surface. And so that really does help define what you need to do quickly and easily. Mm. Nice. 
And where do you find your design inspiration working in such a complex environment? It's funny, our team, we have all sorts of different varied backgrounds and interests. Uh. And we all bring something different to the table, whether it's the guys that are into hockey and they look at the gloves and they think, Oh, look at the protection mobility all in one. How can we incorporate that? For me, uh, I'm into fashion, and I find <laughs> things flipping through the pages of Vogue every now and then. Wow. There was the, wow. the Fashion Fund Awards, and there was a company, I think it was in the UK, they had something called Fabrican. It won a CFDA that year, and it was a spray-on textile. Uh. And obviously, that's not something we're immediately going to take for a spacesuit, but that same mm. idea, how can we make a spray-on spacesuit? Is wow. that something we can take from that world and bring it into ours? Like patching up and things, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Uh. You could use it as a quick seal. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. We have a couple of gifts for you as well. As we talked about, we want to present Give you her a warm applause. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.